It's a pleasure for me to uh, moderate um, our webinar today. My name is Safiya Mohibat from CSIS Indonesia. Uh, let me begin by introducing that this webinar is a part of the series of webinars that CSIS is co-hosting with the uh, with Grips Japan and then RSIS Singapore. Um, uh, a series of webinars uh, throughout this year uh, on various issues related to the Indo-Pacific. Um, we are happy today. So this uh, this time um, is the second one uh, of this current project. Um, we have the pleasure of having um, His Excellency Dr. Rizal Sukma uh, to discuss with us um, uh, on the understanding the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific and Indonesian perspective. Uh, before we begin uh, the event, uh, I would like to kindly ask uh, Dr. Philip Sermonte, CSI's Executive Director, to give his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Fifi. And uh, uh, on behalf of uh, CSIS and FIPS and uh, hmm. RSIS in, in, in Singapore, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Uh, as Fifi mentioned earlier, uh, this is a continuing collaboration between the three institutions. Uh, despite the pandemics, we try uh, to have a, a continue our discussion on various issues, in, in particular the ones that affect the, the, the region. And today, uh, we are going to discuss about the Indonesian perspective on the ASEAN outlook of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma will be the, the, the speaker. And I would also thank uh, the two uh, discussions, uh, Dr. <clears throat> Sinderpal Singh of RSI, and also Dr. Yusuke Takagi uh, from, from GRIF. And, uh, if I may say a few words about the topic and uh, why we come up with this topic is that despite the pandemic, uh, despite that uh, we have a new uh, president in the White House, the rivalry, uh, of course, between the US and China continues. And uh, of course, it uh, affects our uh, part of the world, uh, especially from the Indonesian perspective. Uh, contrary to the early hopes uh, that we have, the Biden administration uh, has not turned back the clock on the US-China competition before the days uh, of Trump. Instead, uh, uh, it now has a vision of uh, open in the Pacific by enlisting uh, uh, treaty uh, allies and like-minded partners in the region. So in the face of the continued, uh, continued uh, rivalry between the two uh, superpowers, the core interest of ASEAN remains, uh, and that's for sure. Uh, that is first uh, to maintain uh, ASEAN centrality in the region architecture uh, that uh, ASEAN has built since the, uh, the end of the Cold War. And the second interest, the second main interest of ASEAN uh, would be to keep uh, ASEAN strategic autonomy uh, from being dominated by either, uh, either one of the great powers. So uh, the ASEAN outlook of uh, the Pacific would be a strategic answer. Uh, from the ASEAN part. Uh, this is uh, the collective vision of uh, ASEAN member states uh, in the face of competing vision, visions of the uh, extra-regional powers on the, what would the strategic architecture be in the, uh, in the Pacific region. So uh, probably these questions of uh, whether or not ASEAN can maintain uh, the core interest uh, of its centrality and strategic autonomy uh, in the increasing uh, power competition to the AOIP, and also uh, a question of uh, whether or not can the AOIP uh, go become, <clears throat> to become more than just a norm setting exercises. And uh, I think uh, these uh, two questions would uh, probably be the, the, the subject of uh, Dr. Nizal's uh, uh, talk uh, this afternoon. So with that, I, I hope that uh, we are going to have a good discussion. Uh, I turn the screen to you. Thank you so much, uh, Phillips. Um, as was uh, introduced by Phillips, um, today we will be discussing uh, into further details about the ASEAN outlook on, on Indo-Pacific. Um, the OIP was introduced um, two years ago already now. It was introduced June 2019. Um, we saw it um, as a collective response of the ASEAN countries um, to the key challenges facing the region, uh, and in particular, you know, navigating the strategic rivalry between the U.S. Uh, and China. But I think, you know, fast forward two years uh, after that, um, right now, I think um, 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 the challenges facing in the Pacific um, has significantly changed as well with the pandemic. 
Uh, and also, you know, um, Indonesia, I think, um, um, is also um, going through a lot of, of different challenges uh, in terms of foreign policy. So I think today um, it's only very timely that um, we um, hear um, some um, ideas and insights from uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma on the basically an Indonesian perspective uh, in understanding the ASEAN outlook on in the Pacific. Um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma. He is now um, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, CSIS in Indonesia. Uh, previously, he was Indonesia's ambassador to the United Kingdom, Ireland, and the IMO uh, from 2016 to 2020. Uh, and before that, he was um, uh, executive director of, of CSIS as well. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma, I hand over the screen to you, please. Thank you, uh, Pifi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, it's always good to be back. And then, you know, especially uh, even though through the screen, you know, we can I can uh, meet my, my old friends, you know, uh, Ambassador Imura, it's good to see you. Uh, Takeshi Shou Kono-san, after we met in London two or three years ago, you know, so <laughs> I'm happy to host you in London at that time. So it's great you know, to be back and then, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and can uh, discuss issues uh, that are relevant, you know, to all of us, you know, in the, you know, in, 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 in the region. Uh, I will try to be very brief because, you know, I think it's much better if we, you know, discuss uh, more you know on the on, on the subject rather than you know listening to the long presentation uh, and then also especially uh, hopefully that you know we can get you know more input as well from the two discussion my old friend you know Sindra Paul uh, Singh it's good to see you uh, as well and I'm really happy you know to have you on board you know to discuss this particular uh, issue let me begin by uh, saying that you know I think uh, all of us in the region you know understand very well why ASEAN uh, felt compelled, you know, to actually issue the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So I don't have to really dwell into the uh, discussions on, on what are the backgrounds and why, you know, and, and so on. But suffice it to say uh, that, you know, we all worried, you know, in the regions when we observe the developments in, uh, in the regions where all uh, the major powers, you know, the, beginning with Japan and then also India uh, and, and uh, Australia, and uh, finally, in the US, you know, all came up with their uh, outlook, their own vision about what sort of, you know, Indo-Pacific regions that uh, they want, you know, they want, uh, they want to see. And, and, and you know, these competing uh, uh, visions of regional order, you know, of course, you know, will pose a challenge, you know, to ASEAN if ASEAN did not participate in the discourse, did not actually uh, uh, make it clear, you know, ASEAN also has its own uh, uh, vision, its own aspiration about the, 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 the future of regional order, you know, either in the Asia Pacific or in the Pacific, you know, uh, depending on which term that you, 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 you prefer. You know, because I think uh, all the ASEAN countries at the time, uh, beginning in the early, uh, in, in the around uh, 2006, 16, 2017, uh, we, are, we were very worried that, you know, this, a new discourse, you know, on the Indo-Pacific and the regional order that you know uh, all other great powers want to uh, create in, in the region actually might pose a challenge, you know, to either ASEAN centrality and you know uh, 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 Southeast Asia's strategic autonomy because these are the two uh, core interests of uh, uh, ASEAN, which I think you know will not change uh, in in the years you know to come. So the changes, you know, in the Indo-Pacific, the perception in the region at the time, especially among the Indonesian policymakers, that if ASEAN did not do anything, then you know that would actually uh, pose serious problem to three uh, uh, possible uh, uh, outcomes of this uh, development that might, you know, uh, undermine ASEAN centrality and uh, uh, ASEAN's uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, number one, ASEAN is worried that you know if it did not participate, then you know it would marginalize you know the role of, of, of ASEAN. Number two, you know also the inaction of ASEAN and no response from ASEAN you know to the uh, growing uh, discourse would also undermine uh, the uh, unity of ASEAN, which finally uh, would also I think uh, raise a lot of questions regarding the uh, relevance you know of, of ASEAN as a regional uh, 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 manager of the you know, regional order, albeit the diplomatic 
manager of regional order. So these are the uh, concern at the time. So that's why uh, uh, Indonesia uh, starting, I think in, in, in January uh, 2018, uh, started you know, to encourage you know, the ASEAN on discussion, ASEAN on uh, uh, debate regarding to the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, I, I was part of that uh, discussion back home uh, at the time, you know, because you know, from, even from London, I had to fly you know, back to, to Jakarta in order to uh, contribute you know, to the discussion uh, within the Indonesia's you know, policy making uh, and you know, environment. But at that time, the discussion within Indonesia really uh, suggested that uh, or revolved around four or six uh, uh, main issues that any ASEAN outlook or any ASEAN vision of Indo-Pacific you know, should, should, should have. The first one, the, the vision should not only reconcile the competing visions of regional order, but also ensure the relevance of centrality uh, of ASEAN as manager of regional order. So that the first, I think, uh, element that you know, Indonesia proposed uh, to be included. The second one, it should be based on the principle of inclusivity. So it should not be you know, uh, uh, made as an instrument to exclude uh, some powers and to include uh, 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 some. So ASEAN has always been, you know, I think, uh, uh, preferable to the approach of you know, inclusivity. The third element, so the ASEAN vision of Indo-Pacific must function to mitigate strategic rivalry among the major powers, especially between the US and China. Number four, it should create the opportunity for bringing countries to harness the potential of the two strategic oceans uh, for the benefits you know, of uh, countries in the region. Number five, it must ensure the sea as a public good you know, by developing connectivity through maritime infrastructure development. And number six, the Indo-Pacific should be based you know, on rules. So it should be a rules-based a regional order uh, that uh, 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 that we want to you know to create. So then you know uh, in June after like more than one year discussion with other ASEAN uh, member states, then ASEAN finally you know launched uh, the uh, document, five pages document, very short you know about the ASEAN outlook on uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. A second part of what I want to discuss is actually more on the characteristic of the ASEAN outlook, but I think. Uh, we are all quite uh, are familiar with that, so there is no need you know, to discuss it, except let me say very briefly, uh, uh, the characteristic of a regional order that ASEAN is really uh, wants to see. Uh, so it should have a number of, of, of characteristics. Yeah? Number one, ASEAN prefer to see the Indo-Pacific, which is inclusive. That's, you know, I think, really uh, 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 included you know, in the documents, so the, which is you know, the inclusive as the, one of the principles that you know, uh, all powers, all uh, our countries in the region subscribe to, that you know, the regional order that we want to create should be an inclusive. The second uh, characteristic is actually, uh, it should actually uphold you know, the rules-based regional you know, architecture. So the, the documents also uh, mention uh, that's an element. Number four, number three, ASEAN wants to see the Indo-Pacific region as a region of dialogue and cooperation instead of rivalry. So that is the third you know, characteristic of the Indo-Pacific that ASEAN wants you know, to, you know, to, you know, uh, to have. Number four, uh, it, it promotes development and prosperity for all. So there is very strong uh, cooperative element you know, in the uh, ASEAN outlook. And then you know, the importance of maritime domain and perspective in the evolving regional architecture. So these are the, uh, in short, you know, the elements or characteristic of regional order that ASEAN wants you know, to see. And then the documents you know, went on to discuss uh, the objective of, of, the, uh, of the ASEAN uh, outlook. So, but you know, uh, I, I don't want to go into detail on those you know, objectives because you know, most of the objectives are actually the normative one, normative one. So it's really, you know, it's a very typical ASEAN. You know, it actually bring in all the normative principles, you know, into, uh, you know, into, in, into doc, document. So based on that, you know, I would say that the ASEAN outlook is an outlook, you know, it's just an aspiration rather than a strategy, even though, you know, it does include a number of areas for cooperation, but, you know, the uh, document does not tell us how, you know, those areas of uh, cooperation or priority areas, they call it, you know, will contribute to the establishment 
of regional order with the four characteristic and I mentioned, or how you know uh, this document can actually achieve the uh, objective that the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific already set out for itself, you know, within within the uh, the uh, document. So it's really you know with the questions now after two years, probably we can do a, a tentative evaluation to what extent this document or ASEAN uh, already contribute to the emergence of a regional order in the Indo-Pacific that has the four characteristics that you know, it, it mentioned in the documents. So this is, I think, the third part of the uh, talk that I would, uh, the discussion that I would like to also uh, put forward. So number one on the implementation. So I think we know from very beginning, it's not easy to implement you know, the uh, uh, cooperative agenda of the uh, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Indonesia already started to try to emphasize that it can work by planning to have the infrastructure and connectivity forum in 2020. But, you know, for the reason that was not, you know, uh, predicted back in 2009, it had to be postponed, you know, because of the pandemic, and then it has to be postponed, you know, into 2021 even though you know we don't know yet when in 2021 so this you know can be uh, 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 can can take place so it really suggests that you know the cooperative agenda uh, is now i think uh, even more difficult you know to actually implement due to the due to the, the, the pandemic so in that context i think uh, uh, asean needs to reformulate the priority areas of cooperation to include this critical issue that we face at the moment and, and bring in how that you know the uh, Indo-Pacific countries should cooperate you know on uh, this you know addressing the pandemic. That's I think uh, number one. So in terms of implementation, you know the the the, the outlook you know cannot give uh, more guidance than that. Second, the ASEAN outlook envisions the Indo-Pacific as a region of cooperation instead of rivalry. We know, like you know, uh, Philip and Pippi just mentioned you know in their opening remark, there have been no signs yet that the US-China rivalry would act anytime soon. So we are going to see even, you know, the uh, probably intensification of the rivalry. So the ASEAN vision, ASEAN outlook, that this region will be uh, characterized by more cooperation rather than rivalry is still, I think, it's very far from reality. Number three, the US-China rivalry, if it continues to escalate, would in turn make it more challenging to, for ASEAN to preserve you know, its strategic autonomy, to stay you know, uh, uh, neutral you know, in this uh, 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 growing uh, rivalry. Uh, I, I've been doing a short survey of those articles written by uh, people or scholars you know, in, in the regions, especially coming out from Singapore. Uh, many uh, 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 scholars like, uh, I think, William Chung and others, you know, and Yung Fung, they all actually argued that it's very difficult for ASEAN you know, to stay neutral. Even Singapore probably one day has to choose, you know, either the US or China. So there is this growing pessimism, if you like, that if this rivalry continues, then ASEAN centrality, ASEAN strategic autonomy will be uh, undermined. Then, you know, uh, uh, some ASEAN countries might have to choose. But my arguments always, of course, coming from Indonesia. So we have to do whatever we can in order to preserve that strategic autonomy because we don't want to go back to the 1970s and 80s where so the Asia. You know, actually became the stage you know for great powers uh, rivalry number four after two years ASEAN is clearly not yet in the position to declare that the stated ASEAN outlook's objective of maintaining centrality has been assured and I think recent development in the regions like you know the emergence of of quad you know when especially when quad became the uh, standalone you know forum would dilute the convening power of, of ASEAN so I think uh, 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 the, the, the ASEAN outlook document, while it reiterates the importance you know, of ASEAN centrality in shaping uh, Indo-Pacific order, it has not given us a concrete guidance on how ASEAN should ensure that principle you know, amid the growing challenge posed by the US and China rivalry. And finally, I think ASEAN is also faced with difficult task of ensuring that the Indo-Pacific order is rules-based. You know? So this is still, I think, uh, the challenge that ASEAN, ASEAN face. So in that context, you know, I would like to really emphasize that ASEAN should really make at least you know, the uncross 
you know, as the core rules that will define and shape you know, the uh, Indo, uh, Indo Pacific uh, uh, order. So, this is, I think, the more realistic uh, uh, step that ASEAN uh, should really take in order to create you know, that you know, uh, rules based order in, in the region. Why? You know, because we see that for coming years, the maritime domain will be the stage where this rivalry, you know, I think, will be increasingly felt you know, by uh, many countries you know, in, in, in the years to come. So, I think, you know, as Fifi keep looking at me on the screen, so I think I just stop there and then, you know, uh, I, we can discuss it, you know, later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma. Um, now, I think um, uh, Dr. Sukma, you know, touched upon very important questions, um, especially, you know, uh, the question that, you know, can ASEAN go beyond norm setting exercise? Uh, you know, it, it has always been the, the challenge of the critic post to, to, to ASEAN, can it go beyond norm setting exercise? Now is especially uh, a very important question um, in the context of shaping uh, the Indo-Pacific order. Um, from um, uh, the presentation of the Dr. Rizal Sukma, I would like now to uh, go to uh, Dr. Sinder Palsik from uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies, uh, NTU Singapore, um, as our first um, discussant. Uh, Dr. Singh, please, you have the screen now. Thank you, Fee. Um, I want to thank the organizers for uh, you know, making me part of this very interesting, I think, useful conversation. So, so it's very nice to see my old friend, uh, Papa Riza, uh, although not in person, but at least <laughs> virtually. Now, um, as, uh, as, 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 you know, as a moderator pointed out, um, Rizal has made a couple of very interesting points. So what I'd like to do is maybe just uh, make three uh, sets of reflections or questions that will lead to a discussion. Uh, these are not necessarily questions. Some of them are just reflections. Now, uh, I'm not going to summarize what Rizal said because I think he did it very well himself. But my first you know, thought, reflection was, so he, he, I, I, had a, I had a chance to, to read a short a, a version of uh, Rizal's talk uh, as a paper. Now, you get the sense that, of course, the, we all know the narrative, the AYP was necessary because uh, you couldn't keep quiet for too long. You know, other people have seized the narrative. But I think the question here, how, I think the question that comes to mind is, can we actually save the term though? As in, by the time the AYP comes, was the Indo-Pacific term already infused by so much of different meanings that by the time the AYP intervention comes, it's too late to save the term Indo-Pacific. Largely because, for example, I, I'm thinking of how I can't see and I haven't read anywhere where any version of the Indo-Pacific would be acceptable to China, for example. So, my, my, my reflection is, yeah, I understand why the AYP is there, but is, can the term actually be rescued? Is the, you know, I mean, the, the, the fruit of that tree, can it, can it, can, is there any way of rescuing, is there any way of trying to infuse meanings to the Indo-Pacific, like Papa Riza was trying to explain, that can rescue the term. Also on this note, you realize that even though the AYP has been there and like, uh, you know, Riza pointed out, it is, uh, you know, it's a perspective on how ASEAN uh, wants to approach the Indo-Pacific, there are some ASEAN countries which go out of their way to not use the term Indo-Pacific at all. And this comes back to my faith, my first point, that there are limits to rescuing the term in the sense that what meanings you can give the term, right? So I think that is one, one issue. In this case, I mean, uh, Rizal was obviously presenting the Indonesian view. The Indonesian case, of course, is slightly different because Indonesian uh, officials are using the Indo-Pacific term even before AYP came about. So for Indonesia, the transition was not too difficult. For other ASEAN countries, on the other hand, using the term itself is loaded. So I'm wondering how, how we can you know, traverse that, that issue. Well, the second point Rizal made about soft balancing and strategy, I think it's a really good point. And I think the way you, you laid it out, very interesting. You, you talked about how uh, the soft balancing needs to happen as a diplomatic exercise, right? And you talk about how you know, ASEAN is, is, the, is, the, is a kind of diplomatic manager of regional relations. I think, I, I think that point has been discussed quite a bit about soft balancing as a response to, 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 to the kind of increased great power uh, rivalry in the region. But I think one issue that comes out of this is that the soft balancing is, it's not ASEAN that's doing the soft balancing. It is individual ASEAN countries soft balancing outside. 
for example, the Quad Plus initiative, right? So we see some soft balancing exercises going on there. Uh, uh, some signaling going on. Vietnam is in the Quad Plus group of countries. Wasn't discussing military affairs, but still, I think they know very well the, the connotation that Quad has. When you join Quad Plus, you, you know very well what kind of signals you're sending out. So I think in that sense, on one level, there's, there is soft balancing happening, but it's happening not, it's not ASEAN doing it. It's happening in smaller multilaterals um, um, outside ASEAN. Another example is how on an individual level, certain ASEAN countries are upping their defense engagement with what would be considered newer uh, external powers. Yes. France, for example, um, is, is France is a good example, right? France has this Indo-Pacific strategy. You can see different ASEAN countries upping their defense relationship. Some cities as a form of soft balancing. Again, it's not ASEAN doing it. It's not within the ASEAN. Um, done by you know by individual ASEAN countries. One another another quick example, of course, is India. India isn't new to the game, but in the last ten years, if you see the kind of defense relationship that India has built with uh, individual ASEAN states, it's gone up, you know, substantially. Again, saw so balancing, but being done individually. So is that does that really fit into what um, Bapa Riza are talking about? Maybe the soft balancing is to happen by individual countries and ASEAN? I, I, I don't know. My last point, um, and this is like, you know, this is like the a perpetual ASEAN angst kind of comment. I, I, I like the point you made about the EAS actually fitting very nicely as an Indo-Pacific platform because in a sense, it captures most of the countries that are there it's, it's got a history, it's got a process. Why don't we, we, we use it? I, I think one, one, one issue that comes out when you, when you, when you hear voices in, in Washington and in, in Delhi, especially given my, my association where I spent a lot of time before COVID going to Delhi, the ASEAN way is no longer seen as neutral. The ASEAN way, if you go to Delhi, is seen to have benefited China more than India and the US. Now, if you accept that, now there's nothing wrong with ASEAN per se. They haven't you know, not done the job. But what's happened is that the strategic context has changed, right? And now with the changing strategic context, people in New Delhi say we, the ASEAN way doesn't work because military balancing needs to happen. That's the only way we can meet the threat from China. So in that scenario, what does ASEAN do? It can do two things. One is keep trying to say, look, the Indo-Pacific, our outlook, we got EAS, let's keep it EAS, rule-based order, inclusive. But the other way to go is to say, rest, we are realistic about what we're doing. We will be, we can convene, so we remain a convening power. We're the only person, only group of states that can ask everyone to come together. But we probably cannot manage relations anymore. Why don't we step aside and maintain that second uh, interest which you talked about, Rizal, strategic autonomy. So maybe we can differentiate now. We don't longer do the managing of regional relations because it's impacting our strategic autonomy. Leave that because what we used to do, we can't do anymore. But we stand aside so that we can protect strategic autonomy. I think I leave it there. Uh, and thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sinder Vosing, um, for your uh, comments. Uh, the next, uh, the second discussion um, that we have today is uh, Dr. Yusuke Takagi, uh, Associate Professor at the National Graduate Institute of Policy Studies uh, in Japan. Before I hand over the screen to Dr. Yusuke Takagi, I'd like to inform all of the uh, participants joining us today that you can also you know, make comments and ask questions um, using the feature Q&A uh, in the Zoom platform. So just use that. Uh, and then type your questions and then um, I will read out the questions later on. Um, those of you who are joining us as a panelist here uh, can either raise your hand or send me a comment. Uh, and uh, if time allows, I will um, uh, allow you uh, some screen time as well. So uh, Dr. Yusuke Takagi, you have the screen now, please. Uh, thank you very much, Fifi. And uh, thank you very much for the organizers and then everybody uh, make this very important event possible. It's, it's a great honor for me to be a part of 
this event and especially that to be a discussant of a distinguished diplomat like Dr. Arisa Fuma. Thank you very much. So uh, as a discussant, I think I have four points. First point is about the kind of the uh, mushrooming interest of Indo-Pacific after AOIP. AOIP was um, launched two years ago. And after that, many countries and institutions are interested in Indo-Pacific. Everybody now knows European Union, Germany, France, and so on. So many countries are talking about Indo-Pacific. And how do you assess this situation? Uh, my first point is similar to the point by, raised by Dr. Sin. As he said that some people say ASEAN way is not neutral. In the same way, we can say that Indo-Pacific is not neutral. And uh, the more country, especially European countries, join this kind of bandwagon of Indo-Pacific discussion, it sounds more like it's no more neutral Indo-Pacific in the world. Uh, and then does it mean we are rescuing the concept of Indo-Pacific? And <laughs> this is my uh, question. Like if you want to make Indo-Pacific neutral, how do you uh, think about the situation that many people are talking about Indo-Pacific in the world, except one country? The first point. And the second point is, uh, I really understand your concern that ASEAN might be uh, marginalized when ASEAN uh, did not launch in the Pacific at the moment. So, and then also I really appreciate um, your emphasis on the role of, or possible role of EAS to promote in the Pacific. And then here, uh, my question is, can we find any linkage between the EAS and the new Biden administration's initiative of the so-called Build Back Better World B3W uh, initiative launched at the G7 summit? And it was an interesting uh, initiative to, in a sense, counter BRI. And so now, before we only had a BRI on the table, but now if the Biden administration became serious about this B3W, we have to, we can think about a kind of balanced view about infrastructure development. And I think East Asian Summit might be an arena where we discuss this kind of uh, varieties of the initiative to promote infrastructure development in the world. This is the second point. And the third point is about UNCROS. I strongly agree that we should promote UNCROS. And, uh, in terms of maritime governance, we have many development. I don't need to elaborate in front of the expertise here, but uh, we now have many uh, kind of patrols, uh, multinational kind of patrol mechanism, Malacca Strait uh, patrol, and then the tri uh, uh, three country uh, patrols in Sulu Sulawesi seas. And we have these kind of uh, you know, operation wise, and at the same time, uh, we have observed the kind of the proposal or submission of the extended continental shelf by Malaysia and Indonesia. So we have many um, initiatives to promote UNCLOS or to make it more substantial. And then in the context of ASEAN, which, you know, which venue should be the most kind of uh, practical venue to discuss uh, UNCLOS agenda? Uh, because the discussion about so-called uh, code of conduct, uh, it, I don't think it's a good venue for us to discuss UNCLOS. Maybe we can find something new or some, somewhere else to discuss UNCLOS. So what can be a practical arena where we discuss uh, UNCLOS is the third point. And the fourth point is a bit uh, kind of special one uh, because I'm from Tokyo and then uh, uh, Dr. Rizal from Jakarta. So my first question, uh, the last question is about Japan-Indonesia relation. Uh, Japan-Indonesia enjoyed a very close relation in various uh, areas. And the one thing that I want to highlight is a two plus two. The two plus two uh, by foreign service and defense service. It's a very special compared with Japan's relation with other Southeastern countries. And what do you think about the prospects of two plus two of these uh, uh, in the region? Do you expect that two plus two should be expanded to uh, other countries uh, aside from Indonesia? Aside, and then maybe we can think about two plus two with Singapore, two plus two plus uh, two plus two with other ASEAN member countries. But at the end, uh, and then 
and it's good for the bilateral relation. But what do you think about the implication of uh, regional order by uh, making this two plus two? Um, I mean, if we support two plus two, then what will be the implication to the regional order? This is the last question. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Isuke Takagi. Um, before um, I uh, read out some of the questions that we have already received um, some very interesting questions in the Q&A um, box, but before um, I read out some of these questions, uh, probably I will give a few minutes to uh, Dr. Riza Sukma to maybe respond to some of the uh, points uh, raised by Dr. Singh and um, Dr. Uh, Takagi. Please, uh, Dr. Sukma. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, I think it's great, really uh, 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 respond, you know, to the uh, paper that I wrote, even though I, many part of that paper, I didn't really actually uh, talk about, you know, in my short presentation. But let, let me begin with the key questions about the term, because the term itself you know, has become subject of this rivalry, you know, not only between the US and China, but almost, you know, uh, among the, the, the major powers. Uh, this is too bad because you know I propose a different term, you know, to, to, to use at the time for, for, for ASEAN. I proposed that in 2014, but nobody paid attention. It, you know, I call it as the Pasindo, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean uh, region, because in my view, the key issue that we need to actually use as a platform for cooperation and for regional order is the importance of the maritime you know, domain, because this is where both rivalry and cooperation will take place. So a new concept, you know, that will emphasize the importance of the maritime domain will, I think, you know, really uh, serve as the way out of that, you know, uh, rivalry among the terms you know, that both uh, US and, and China actually compete on. So, but now it's too late, you know, to actually rescue uh, that uh, 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 term, you know, because the Indo-Pacific, has become, you know, a term that everybody uh, use except China. I think, you know, so I think because you know their perception is that they see this concept as an attempt to actually, you know, marginalize or at least, you know, to reduce the importance of rise of China within the emerging regional order. But for many others, it's actually, you know, to actually create a way of looking at the regions where that way should reflect. The reality of the day, you know, because of course now since India is important, it's become integral part of the, the of the region. So you can't distinguish anymore or separate Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia or East Asia and West A Asia, because the whole area has become one geopolitical and geoeconomic unit. So if we really want to rescue it, so probably you know we need to have more discussion about you know a, a concept of Pacific and Indian. Ocean uh, region, you know, as an alternative to the term of Indo-Pacific, that I think still contested until today, and I think still is difficult for uh, China to really uh, accept, you know, that, that 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 term in policy or in a uh, 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 political, you know, sense, because it has a certain, uh, I think, a political implication at least, you know, uh, for you know for, for for China. So that's my my short response for the. First point, you know, both I think uh, Senator Park and Takagisan, you know, raised that a particular uh, 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 point. Number two, uh, quad plus. This is, is interesting. Yeah, number one, of course, it's always been I think uh, a reality in ASEAN that some countries. This is also I think the the the, the source of uh, concern in some uh, other countries that you know it's very hard to have really a collective response, a collective strategy because each member state should also have their own, you know, of course, calculation on how to really deal with the challenges of the day. I remember very well, for example, you know, during the debate on the establishment of ASEAN. At the end, you know, so we all get a compromise with the term that the military base should be temporary, you know, because Indonesia demanded, you know, all the member of prospective member state at the time to remove the military bases, you know, in their countries. But you know, Singapore, uh, Malay, uh, Thailand, and uh, Philippines, of course, opposed to that idea. So you now we found the, the compromise at the time. So each member state, you know, of course, has its own also uh, calculation and its own uh, uh, strategy. So that I think is also the case with the emergence of what. So some member state, I'm sure, will see 
the importance of sectoral partnership you know with uh, the quad but i can't think that any asean member state would like to join the quad and then you know you can't call it quad anymore you know so i think they are open to the partial or sectoral uh, engagement you know with, with, with the quad that's already happening i think with uh, vietnam and and uh, two or three other uh, asean member state you know on, on specific uh, issues of health and and, and, and so on that my my second uh, response the third uh the third one is actually on the i i don't think why you know we should contrast the build uh, a better you know vision or plan with the bri so i completely agree with you takagi san so i think the east asia summit can be a, a forum you know where you know these two uh, initiative you know can coordinate and also even can be a point of cooperation between us and 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 and, and china you know to actually work together you know in order to help the sort east asia's you know countries you know to really uh, uh, do the infrastructure project you know because uh, it is in the interest of both the us and uh, china for asean to stay neutral you know if you like to stay you know to to maintain its strategic autonomy because i don't think that us and and china will benefit you know if say asean breaks up you know into uh, a number i mean if if uh, it's not united anymore because you know that would be a bad not only for asean that's for sure but i think it's going to complicate also the strategic calculation uh, in in the us and also in 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 china so these are the three i think uh, points that I, i would like to respond and others you know of course you know will also respond to other points that both interpal and takagi san you know mentioned Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sukma. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, we quite have a, a, a list of um, questions already in the Q&A section. Maybe I'll start with one. Um, there are several questions um, still wanting to uh, go into details or elaborate the question of the terminology of Indo-Pacific, it seems. Uh, it seems that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it raises, still raises uh, the, the, the following question. I, I know it's been discussed by Dr. Sukma and I think uh, Dr. Singh also discussed it as well. Um, it's the question, you know, how much has Asia Pacific actually evolved into being Pacific that we feel the need to actually use the terminology of Indo-Pacific? Um, or, you know, you can also rephrase that question into being, you know, why should we stop using Asia Pacific? You know, what, what, what is the real problem with it that we need to change it into using Indo-Pacific? So I think this, these are some of the questions that still um, I think um, uh, um, uh, attract curiosity from, from, from a lot of experts. Um, even interesting, you know, because um, Asia Pacific, as we know, is still used very widely, for example, in APAC, uh, us uh, in the track two in, uh, in the region are still widely involved in CISCAP, which is st still calls it um, Asia Pacific, not Indo Pacific. So I think this, you know, this, the, the question of why are we moving from, from Asia Pacific, I think still. Um, still, you know, uh, in the mind um, of, of a lot of people. Maybe I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll uh, let Dr. S uh, Sukma uh, form some answers. Maybe I'll invite uh, Dr. Singh, maybe you'd like to comment on it. Thank you. Uh, well, there's several ways to answer that question. So much has been written on it. Well, I'll just try to maybe answer it one, one, in one, one or many ways. One way, I guess, to look at why the Indo-Pacific has become more important is if you if you accept the notion that um, India-China competition will shape a large part of what will happen in Asia, you accept that notion first. Then the second notion, you accept that as China's influence spreads, the Indian notion is the next kind of area where Chinese influence will spread. It's already spreading, political influence, military influence. And in the other direction, as India's um, economy, um, 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 you know, goes up, its military power goes up, the area in which India will expand would be through the Straits of Malacca into what we call the Pacific Ocean. So the overlap between these two then sort of capture, is captured in the, in the Indo-Pacific because your competition now is over this area which includes the Indian Ocean where India thinks it is the net security provider and the other side of the Pacific, where the US and China obviously for a long time have been competitors. So I guess I will sum it up in that way that that's why the Indo-Pacific become very important because you want to look at India-China competition, you cannot 
you know, you cannot break the, the two oceans up separately. They are interconnected. Papa Riza, I think, summed up very well. This is a single, for some people, this is a single strategic space. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Takagi, uh, do you have any comments? And then I go to Dr. Sukma after that. Okay, uh, just one thing. Yeah, not only security or competition, but also simply because the rise of India as an economic power, uh, which changed the perception toward India. Because for the for the long time, uh, India is a kind of independent civilization, which is independent of other part of the world. That was a very old view, though. But actually, this perception has changed drastically, especially in the twenty first century. So that's why we want to talk about Indo Pacific. That's one economic side. Dr. Sukma, please. I think I just want to, you know, uh, strengthen what uh, echo what you know, Sinar Praja said. You know, because there are three, I think, uh, new reality that you know uh, 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 make it makes more sense to really, you know, uh, think strategically within that you know space of engagement called Indo-Pacific. So I tend to see that as space of engagement for many countries. Number one, it reflects the growing importance of India because India is already part of the East Asia Summit, and then of course, you know. Uh, India's you know, activities will also begin to be uh, seen you know, in, the, uh, in, in the Pacific Ocean and in the South China Sea you know, and so on. So you see it on the other hand, you see also like Sindra Pa said that you know, China also you know, begin to uh, pay more attention to the Indian Ocean. So you see the, the merge. I mean, in the word of the Prime Minister of, of, of Japan, uh, Prime Minister Abe, is the confluence of the two sea that is really, I think, uh, make, it, uh, make more sense you know, for, for us to think in terms of that uh, 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 framework. Number two, these two oceans are central you know, for, for, for the future. This is where both cooperation and also rivalry will take place, it's already taking place. So again, you know, this is the argument by, uh, by, by some you know, uh, uh, ASEAN uh, 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 countries that you know, the center of gravity is moving to this part of the world. And then actually you can't separate the two geopolitical and geoeconomic entity anymore. So that's why you know, it's more useful in terms of strategic thinking, in terms of the policy-wise, or in terms of the academic way of looking at the region, you know, to if you fuse these two part of the world, you know, the Pacific and also the the, the, the Indian Indian Ocean. So that three, I think, argument in itself already, you know, shows that you know it 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 makes more sense, you know, so uh, for 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 us to think within that that framework because the Asia Pacific alone, you know, I, this is from Indonesian perspective. Uh, I remember when we come up with the idea of Indonesia as a fulcrum, you know, within the two ocean, you know, because so far, if this term terminology also defined the way you think about yourself, you know, within this broader uh, a map. So the Indo-Pacific help Indonesians to situate itself and help ASEAN for that matter to locate itself as a fulcrum, these two oceans where rivalry and cooperation will take place in the future. So that's why you know, I think at the end, all these foreign ministers, when they uh, agreed on the uh, document, they also agreed on the Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, they also emphasized the concept of Indo-Pacific, even though, of course, it implied, you know, I think, preference you know, to the US, Japan, India, and Australia. But at the same time, ASEAN understanding is a bit different because it must be inclusive. It must be defined by cooperation rather than rivalry. So ASEAN, I think, needs to work harder to, you know, send that message out. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sukma. Uh, maybe I'll move on to the next set of questions. There are also um, several questions, basically in the same, um, the same tone, um, questioning about uh, ASEAN centrality and AOIP, as you know, Dr. Sukma mentioned, as a, as a norm-setting exercise. Um, you know, uh, the question here, for example, from Dr. Termsak uh, mentions that, you know, ASEAN centrality is basically only, can be, uh, can be argued as valid in Southeast Asia only. So AOIP is thus, you know, probably overstretching ASEAN's credibility. Um, and then, you know, uh, so, so, so the, the, the question is, I mean, I mean how, 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 do, how, how does ASEAN, you know, can continue uh, trying to practice all this, you know, norm setting exercise. I mean, um, Dr. Sukma basically explained, you know, the, the five factors, I think, uh, in his remarks uh, with regards to uh, ASEAN's effort for norm setting. But at the same time, you know, there's also a question mentioning about minilaterals outside of ASEAN, you know, emerging, becoming more and more popular. Is this actually under undermining ASEAN centrality? And does this, do these minilaterals actually go hand in hand in efforts like 
the AOIP. And, you know, and, and then there's also a question looking at, you know, the current pandemic where, you know, where uh, individual nations' interests seem to play a greater role now uh, um, uh, as compared to the interests of collective nations. So, you know, our efforts like AOIP still, you know, still do, do these efforts still matter uh, in, in, the, in the current, um, um, you know, setting of the, of the world? Uh, Dr. Subba, would you like to comment on that? Well, I, you know, I, I prefer others actually, but you know, okay. I, think, I think once, because we already produced that document, we already make it very clear, you know, a number of points, what sort of uh, uh, region that we want, you know, to, 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 you know, to see. I say I need to move now from hope, you know, into the, you know, strategy. That's where the discussion, uh, I think, should, should, should really uh, focus on. But unfortunately, uh, now things have been taken over by a lot of other events. But number one, of course, you know, the uh, pandemic, Number two, Myanmar crisis and our doorstep, which even until today, ASEAN still got no clue on how to, you know, implement the five points uh, uh, consensus that already uh, agreed. So, so, but you know, I think, you know, uh, this is where I think the second track, you know, can comes in and try to give some ideas, you know, to uh, ASEAN on how that we can really operationalize the ASEAN outlook on the Pacific, and then what are the ideas that you know ASEAN uh, should really look at, you know, to uh, make sure that it is not a norm a setting exercise only. So it should also move, you know, to affect and shape the uh, emerging regional order in the future. Uh, Dr. Singh or Dr. Takanti, uh, any of you would like to comment? I, I, I oh, mean, yeah. it's hard to go after, hard to come after Rizal and say something interesting. So I think he's, he summed up most of that, of the discussion. Okay, Dr. Tagagi, would you like to um, say a sentence or two? <laughs> That's much harder. The, the harder we can fire. But anyway, one point is that uh, ASEAN has East Asian Summit. Uh, we should not forget, actually. ASEAN is an only institution which, can, which has an institution covering a big, uh, how to say, big, big areas, in a sense. Because, yeah, when, when I hear the Indo-Pacific, I, I remember in, uh, East Asian Summit. The East Asian Summit is a summit meeting. So because of this summit meeting's nature, people tend to discuss very broad and not so you know, focused issues so far. But I think the future of Indo-Pacific order depends on East Asian Summit in my understanding because many people are actually watching, uh, uh, waiting for the participants uh, from the US to the next East Asian Summit. It shows a kind of the commitment of a new administration who will come and then the, what kind of policy they will prepare for that. So because of East Asian Summit, now we can think about the direction of US, uh, US foreign policy. So in that sense that ASEAN play still has a kind of convener of power in this sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I move on to the next um, uh, question, uh, I'd like, uh, there are several experts joining us as panelists here today. So if any of you, uh, would like to, uh, some screen time to say um, some um, comments or remarks. Please just raise your hand, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll give you some some time to speak as well. Uh, while I wait for some uh, uh, the experts to do that, let me just go to the next question. This is um, on maritime cooperation or maritime issues, basically, and also on South China Sea. Um, if you look at the document of AYP, of course, you see a maritime cooperation as one uh, area for cooperation. Um, but then, you know, the, the first question is actually, uh, you know, uh, is there any prospect to actually for this to be implemented in the future? You know, there are talks about uh, the infrastructure um, a forum, for example. Uh, is there uh, any real prospect for it to be uh, implemented in the future? And then the second question, uh, I think more or less related to that, uh, will AOIP deal also with maritime disputes such as South China Sea? Um, if you look at the document itself, then you know you 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 would say no because it's um, it, it's it, it focuses more. If you look at it, you know very briefly, it focuses more on this whole development and you know economic cooperation. But is there um, you know room uh, for the future? I mean, you look at uh, South China Sea uh, and how it, it's you know currently um, um, developing. Is there a chance for for you know cooperation uh, within the framework of AOIP to actually also touch upon issues like disputes in the South China Sea? Um, uh, I don't know. Anyone want to start or Dr. Sukma, please? Well, um, 
the AOIP has no intention, you know, to become a new forum. That's very clear. You know, so that's why, you know, the operationalization of the areas of cooperation that has been mentioned in the ASEAN Outlook document should actually be, you know, used as reference and also refer those items to other, you know, existing uh, ASEAN uh, uh, led or ASEAN centered cooperation venue. It's already there. Uh, for example, the, the, the questions that raised by uh, Takagi-san earlier on the maritime cooperations, you know, the way it should be uh, uh, done and, and so on. So I can only think of the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum as the appropriate venue, you know, to talk about, you know, how we can strengthen rules, you know, uh, 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 such as the UNCLOS, you know, in, 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 in the region. So that's, you know, only one example. Maritime or rule, uh, maritime rules can be actually uh, uh, used as an area of interest for uh, uh, many countries you know, within the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum. And then we also look at other uh, 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 items that have been mentioned by the document and then try to find uh, the appropriate you know, venues you know, for that. So it doesn't have to be, you have the ASEAN outlook in the Pacific and then you think about a new institution. But in general, I do, I think, uh, still stand with my earlier suggestion that we can actually institutionalize the East Asia Summit. And I think CISCAP already done a lot of work since, I don't know, 2009, yeah, I think there are a lot of memorandum already, you know, uh, to, 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 to really institutionalize and strengthen uh, the uh, uh, East Asia Summit, including, you know, the idea of like rotative, I mean, the uh, co-chairmanship, you know, within, within the uh, uh, member state and, and so on. So it's not exclusively, you know, uh, as, as if only ASEAN can, set the agenda and, and so on. So ideas all there. So it is time now, I think, to bring those ideas again, you know, and discuss it and then see how that still fit you know, within this uh, new uh, uh, strategy environment, new challenges that, that, that we face. Okay, um, Dr. Sheikh or Dr. Takagi, please. Um, I think I mean, just to reiterate, I mean, the, what Rizal said also, I think the problem with the Indo-Pacific is that after a while, there's a lot. It's either a strategy, is it a geopolitical statement? Is it a description of a geographical region? So I, in a sense, like Rizal said, I mean, obviously the ASEAN doesn't want this to become a forum by itself. It has enough forums. It has the EAS. In fact, the worry is that there are too many alternative forums coming up. So that's one. So... In a sense, the AOIP is, I mean, I, I said this before, it looks like, you know, a, a graduate student's a literature review. This person say that, this person say that, this person say that. And the last part, you're not very sure because the supervisor is not sure where you're going to finish the thesis. So it's like a lit review. We know what everybody else has said. We'll see what happens after that. So I think that's what the AOIP is. So to, to say that the AOIP will solve the South China Sea, I think is, that's not what it's there for. It's just to, clarify what ASEAN thinks about what other people are saying. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's no quick solution about dispute in Indo-Pacific or even South China Sea. It's very clear. So not only ASEAN, but uh, I mean, no party can uh, solve it quickly. That's a basic point. And then uh, going back to the AOIP, I think the first uh, area of cooperation is still quite important because the first area of cooperation of AOIP is a maritime cooperation. And then to, um, to mitigate the disputes, first of all, actually we have to watch out these disputes, but uh, the capacity, what is still lacking is a maritime domain awareness. So we should promote this maritime domain awareness to mitigate or at least to, to recognize the disputes uh, clearly. And so this is a long term uh, agenda. I mean, capacity building always is, is a long term agenda. And then the AOIP is on the, on the right track to achieve this kind of long term goal. And aside from that, I'm very much fascinated at the idea of the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum, because here we can think about stakeholders of uh, maritime issues, because uh, discussion about code of conduct is uh, only among ASEAN and the Clayman state. But Clayman state is not necessarily the representative of stakeholders. So maybe we can think about the involvement of stakeholders on this maritime governance issue. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, this one question, um, I think specifically for uh, Dr. Rizal Sukma, uh, quite interesting one. I think uh, in your remarks, yeah, you mentioned 
about, you know, when you explained about the history of UIP and you mentioned about Indonesia's concern that ASEAN, you know, did not take part in the process of uh, shaping in the Pacific. So therefore, you know, these ideas uh, into promoting a, a collective uh, outlook. Uh, and then, then we had uh, the UIP. There's a question um, um, in the list uh, from Gatra, uh, very interesting. Uh, is there a future in Indonesian foreign policy where ASEAN no longer functions as the primary vehicle for regional security, particularly in the management of great power relations? Dr. Sukma, would you like to comment on that? Well, <clears throat> ASEAN will always be in Indonesia's foreign policy, you know, even though uh, we know that, you know, we sometimes quite frustrated with the way ASEAN try to uh, address uh, challenges. <clears throat> so I don't think that, you know, except probably me in the past and probably a little bit now, you know, we want to advocate that <clears throat> probably Indonesia should no longer really rely on ASEAN too much and then try to find other uh, platform, you know, in order to address uh, the different challenges that uh, we all face. So, but, you know, in general, don't, we don't have to be worried about that. So I think Indonesia will always uh, take, you know, ASEAN very seriously. And in fact, we are, in, in my view, too obsessed with ASEAN. So how to actually reduce that Obsession is now a challenge for our foreign policy. So it's not like we are going to abandon it. We have to reduce the obsession you know, of Indonesia on, on ASEAN. Probably Paiso will agree with that. <laughs> so we're too obsessed with ASEAN so far. Everything has to be done through ASEAN. That irritated me a lot. <laughs> Maybe I can follow up uh, with another that, that question to a question to Dr. Takagi. Uh, how do you look at it? I mean, Japan as a dialogue partner for, for ASEAN. Um, I mean, how do you assess this significance of ASEAN to the, the members of ASEAN? And, you know, what are the expectations from the ASEAN dialogue partners towards, you know, the working of ASEAN and should, uh, the fact that it, you know, it, it should be uh, uh, the primary vehicle for regional security? Is that something that Japan truly believes in? I think in my, this is not a government view, of course. <laughs> in of course, my yeah. observation, I think that uh, without saying anything, that the Japanese government is expanding the channels to Southeastern countries. And then actually, it's not all, all I mean, ASEAN is, ASEAN centrality are always Japanese government promotes and respect and all the political documents, the government say, say so. And there's no change. And I think in the future, the, I don't think even in the future, they will not change. But aside from ASEAN, uh, ASEAN and the Japanese government dialogue, we have many, uh, the news. And as I said, that uh, Indonesia-Japan relation is a very interesting case for me. Like uh, two plus two is a very interesting case for me because two plus two uh, is, an, uh, is a venue where uh, foreign secretary and then the defense secretary are talking with each other. And then for the long, long, long history of ASEAN, this kind of, you know, picking up one country is not so good. I mean, people don't encourage this kind of things in my understanding, but actually two plus two between Indonesia and Japan is in a sense, I think um, institutionalized or regularized, I can say maybe. So, and then this kind of things, I haven't seen any repercussion from other Southeast Asian countries. So maybe uh, ASEAN is there, but uh, what will happen is that, yeah, as Dr. Rizal uh, very, uh, very nice way, I mean, uh, explained that uh, reduce the obsession is a very nice word. And we never abandon ASEAN, but uh, we can reduce the obsession. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Singh, any comments to that? No, not really, actually. I, I, I think what he's said has been said, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, I'd like to invite any of the experts uh, joining us as panelists, uh, if you'd like to make any comments. Uh, I don't know, maybe Ambassador Imura or uh, Pak Yusuf Wanandi. Ambassador Imura, please, you have the screen now. You're still muted, uh, Ambassador. <clears throat> Can you hear? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much for this uh, session, and uh, I was I'm very happy to see uh, uh, these are in good shape, and also I could uh, see here uh, Yusuf Wanandi uh, in better shape, and I'm very happy to see, see my my old friends. Uh, this uh, regarding um, uh, AOIP uh, three years ago. Oh, when you launched this idea and this concept, I think uh, 
uh, there was some expectation on the part of uh, uh, dialogue partners that eventually uh, uh, Indonesia, particular, ASEAN, uh, particularly Indonesia, will come up with some concrete plan uh, of uh, proceeding or going ahead with uh, this concept. Uh, unfortunately, maybe because of the pandemic and maybe because of the, the problem uh, of Myanmar uh, affecting uh, stability in the region, uh, there has not been concrete talks uh, among, not only among ASEAN countries, of course, but also with uh, dialogue partners. And uh, uh, meanwhile, for example, Japan, uh, US uh, head of state uh, agreed on supporting AOIP and uh, all, you, as Rizal said, the many countries in uh, European countries, uh, EU, Germany, France, uh, Netherlands, they came up with their own concept regarding AOIP. And we, I think we want to uh, respect the, the centrality of ASEAN. We want to uh, listen to what ASEAN want to do. We don't want to be an uh, invader to, uh, to the ASEAN uh, centrality. Uh, so, uh, but meanwhile, we don't hear very much uh, from ASEAN countries, particularly Indonesia and Singapore and some others, which are uh, have interest in proceeding. Uh, we, we don't, the, the picture is not really clear uh, regarding what you want to do. So uh, what is important, I think, uh, is engaging dialogue uh, between uh, ASEAN countries with, of course, ASEAN countries, uh, divided uh, regarding what should be uh, the future of the Pacific, but uh, some countries which are uh, keenly uh, interested in uh, proceeding with uh, in the Pacific uh, concept and also their partners, uh, maybe uh, it's high time for us to engage the dialogue and not only conceptually, but also concretely what we can do uh, to come up with uh, uh, those uh, five uh, areas, infrastructures, uh, SDGs, maritime corporations, uh, we need to uh, discuss concretely. Otherwise, uh, it uh, might remain the, <clears throat> if I, uh, this, this may be a little bit strong word, but it, it might remain uh, empty words. Uh, conceptually, yes, in the Pacific is now one strategic region, but uh, I think what ASEAN countries, particularly in Indonesia, want to do is uh, to, uh, to materialize, to uh, go ahead with concrete uh, plan of making the region peaceful and prosperous. So it's probably high time for us to talk about this concretely. And uh, if uh, I think uh, CSIS and, uh, and the groups have been talking about uh, organizing some uh, uh, conference uh, uh, toward the end of this year or early next year, but I think uh, we really need to come up uh, with uh, concrete plans and discuss discussing about those issues and to make AOIP uh, concrete uh idea not slogan uh, th this is uh, what i wanted to say and i my question is uh, uh, whether uh, the government of indonesia this is i want to ask uh, with uh, how you observe uh, what uh, uh, the government of indonesia is uh, planning to do to uh, move ahead with uh, this uh, idea, which was, I think, uh, uh, initiated by, by, uh, by you. Uh, so uh, this is my question to Riza. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Imura. Uh, before I hand the screen again to Dr. Sukma, Pak Yusuf Wanandi, can I check up with you? Would, would you like to say something? Yeah, me, Pak. 
Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm in, um, not not because of the COVID that, that I have been in a, in, a, in a pessimistic mode, but after following what we have done on Myanmar and not being able to follow up, is for me one big new token that we cannot depend on ASEAN too much on anything. So therefore. I'm, we have to try it out again, whether what we can do within the context of ASEAN or not, it's a very big question mark, to be frank. And that's why I'm not sure whether uh, if we bring it to ASEAN in the government level, that we can have a lot of uh, uh, actually inputs and, and, and positive participation of the members of ASEAN. Uh, seemingly they are all dormant and, and not very active and therefore uh, let, let, let us watch and see and, and start to stir up things at anyhow, because uh, it's not only the governments that is re responsible for ASEAN, right? We should be as much as responsible for ASEAN than they are with the governments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pa Yusuf. So uh, back to you, Pa Rizal Sukma. Uh, would you like to answer um, Mr. Imura's question? Well, thank you, uh, Imura -san. I can't speak on behalf of the government anymore. I'm a retired, <laughs> uh, so I can speak as an academic. Well, actually, there, I think there were discussion on, on the, the awareness that you know the burden to operationalize and to carry forward the uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific or the responsibility you know, to do that rests with Indonesia. Because we propose it, we uh, actually uh, 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 had all the discussion among the ASEAN member states. And then finally, it became the uh, 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 outlook. Uh, so I think you know Indonesia still has that obligation. So uh, you know, Indonesia should really drive the further discussion. And in fact, you know I think there are four uh, steps that uh, Indonesia should take. You know, uh, this is my own view. Eh? So it's not government policy yet. Yet, uh, number <laughs> one, you know we plan to do the operationalization of those you know uh, areas of cooperation within the, uh, the document. So. I mentioned earlier the plan to organize the infrastructure forum, which will bring uh, uh, the uh, uh, IMF, the World Bank, and also the uh, AIIB and, and others is actually uh, an important one. So because, you know, so we hope that forum uh, will become a forum for coordination among, you know, these uh, 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 global institutions, you know, to really work on and address the problem of uh, infrastructure development in, in the region. So that's only one one example. So uh, operationalization is already started, but you know it's put on hold because of the COVID. Number two, you know I think there was discussion at the time that you know ASEAN needs to move forward to have plan of action, you know drafted, you know for that the uh, uh, outlook. Number number three, so they we have to have a consultations with all the dialogue partners on how you know, uh, ASEAN and the dialogue partners can actually utilize the uh, uh, outlook you know, as a new platform, you know, for strengthening cooperation in the regions, at least across the four areas that have been identified. Number five, number four, uh, that we plan at the time, you know, to drive this debate again, discussion again on the institutionalization of the platform to create a regional order, the East Asia Summit. So the foreign ministry already did a number of studies on that back in 2016. You know, so uh, I was also involved in that in, in that study, uh, but it's put on hold because of these you know current challenges that we face. So this you know I think four next steps that Indonesia is or should you know be prepared you know, to take. Uh, but the opportunity will come only in 2023, you know, because Indonesia will be the chair. So hopefully this you know can be you know, uh, part of the agenda of the Indonesia's chairmanship of ASEAN so they can, you know, we can move forward you know, with this you know, agenda, including, of course, you know, the most important critical one, resolving the Myanmar crisis. So I hope okay, you, so I you some curiosity, Pa. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pa uh, Riza Sukma. Okay, um, I have two more questions uh, on the list here, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll just put them together, uh, and any of the panelists um, here can can uh, can give their comments on that. 
The first one is regarding uh, U.S. engagement in, in Southeast Asia. There has been a lot of criticisms about, you know, U.S. Uh, lacking engagement in Southeast Asia, um, how serious they are about, you know, um, uh, working closer together with ASEAN, for example. Uh, you know, if any of the panelists uh, would like to comment uh, on that and how, you know, uh, that should affect, um, you know, ASEAN's position amidst the, uh, the uh, strategic rivalry between the U.S. and, and China. And then the next question here is, um, interestingly, of course, there are still, you know, many questions regarding the OIP, um, some misunderstandings, some concerns, I think. And I think one of the concerns that have been posed, and all, although, you know, uh, all of the speakers here um, have, um, have clarified about what AYP uh, entails, mm -hmm. but there are still some concerns about, you know, uh, that there are military dimension of the AYP. Um, um, to what extent that is true? Um, should you know other regions be concerned if there are a military dimension of AYP? You know how should the other regions uh, understand what AYP uh, is all about? Uh, I'll allow uh, the three uh, uh, speakers to to uh, give their comments on the two questions and maybe also some um, uh, words uh, to close uh, the discussion as well. Dr. Sukma, to you first. Well, I have only very short response to that uh, first questions. So I think this is, is important for the United States, you know, to not define its policies towards Southeast Asia in terms of its rivalry with China, because it doesn't fly. I don't think that we are interested, you know, in, in, in being a backyard of either China or the US. So in that context, so I think the US should really uh, formulate, you know, uh, uh, a Southeast Asia's policy on its own. So it's not defined in terms of, uh, uh, a rivalry, you know, with, with, with China, you know, for example, now we are tired of looking at this, you know, war on the efficacy of which vaccine is better, you know, while on the other hand, we all actually are longing for a, a vaccine, whatever available uh, and, you know, at the moment. So it's, it's not helpful, you know, in, you know, in that, you know, in that context. So, and, and ASEAN, I don't think that, you know, we are in a position, you know, to actually force the U.S. to engage, whether it's will engage or not engage, it's really up to the U.S. And on the other hand, you know, we will continue to engage and you know, everyone and it's open to any cooperation with any, I think, uh, extra regional powers, especially the uh, dialogue partners. So that's, you know, I think, uh, uh, my response to uh, the role of, of the US or the US engagement, BP. Okay, would you like to comment on the second question regarding, you know, concerns about military dimension of the OIP? Military dimension? Yes, there, there's, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of concerns and probably, you know, misunderstanding about what AOIP is about. Some countries no, or I, regions no. might view it differently, yeah. As, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the AOIP is written, you know, with a very typical ASEAN language and also reflects a very typical ASEAN response to a strategic uh, 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 challenge. So, so it, it really relies on norms and institutions, you know, in order to deal with geopolitical challenge. So that's also at the same time a problem, you know, because in my view, being a realist myself, norms and institution on one hand is true that it can modify a state behavior, but at the same time, norms and institution can only function effectively within a stable regional balance of power. So that's, you know, I think where the challenge lies in terms of, you know, policy-wise, you know, what sort of a strategy that ASEAN needs to uh, come up with. So it should really rely on norms and institution, but at the same time, it also needs a stable balance of power for norms and institution to work. But unfortunately, it doesn't have any uh, leverage in order to shape that balance of power. So that's the ASEAN predicament from its you know, birth in 67, probably until the end of the world. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Sukma. Uh, Dr. Singh, please. Hey, uh, yeah, just quickly, just for your results comments. I think the, the, the US lack of interest is just a perpetual ASEAN angst, right? Every few years, you always say, why don't, why don't they like us? You know, why do you go to me along the corridor? So a call got cancelled. So I think that's firstly is perpetual angst. But number two, I think there's something else. And this is, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a continuation. I think Rizal sort of signaled that in his paper that there is a, bipartisan consensus to stand China. And the consensus is that it was earlier that you could militarily maybe be China and then 
corporate and other areas, I think that that sense is gone. That every area now is a, a domain of competition. 5G, vaccine, economic cooperation, everything is a domain of competition. And I think with that, the space for for uh, for Saudi Asia or for ASEAN, um, you know, to, to make a difference gets narrowed. So that's, I think, in, in a sense, that's how I, 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 I see it. Uh, and then on, on, on a military thing, I, I really don't understand because I don't see anything in the OIP that even alludes to any kind of military alliance. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an attempt to try to wrest the discourse back, as Rizal said, you know, infuse ASEAN meanings into the Indo-Pacific. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Takagi? Thank you very much. As a lawyer discussed, and I really want to repeat my favorite line today, reduce the obsession. And about the US, actually, maybe we can reduce the obsession to the US foreign policy towards Asia, or maybe as a, I mean, obsession on great powers. Great power is always there. So anyway, we should not neglect, but at, at the same time, we should not be obsessed that uh, what the US is doing. And especially under this administration, we should um, broaden our eyesight. As I said, that uh, Biden administration interesting launch, interesting uh, infrastructure initiative at G7, and then Indonesia is a part of G20, and then the implementation of this B3W is, I think, the discussed uh, on the way to the G7 and G20. So when we think about infrastructure development, we have to broaden our eyesight not only to not only to look at the bilateral U.S. and some other country relations, but at the same time we have to. Uh, look at the uh, US um, uh, like a multilateral diplomacy. This is also important arena we have to watch out. And about the military dimension, let me twist a bit discussion. I think that AOIP should cover military dimension too, because the biggest concern for me is that the military expenditure of the individual country of Southeast Asia, or not only Southeast Asia, Asia and uh, many countries are buying many weapons. And then we have to introduce rule-based order. And AOIP is talking about rule-based order. So when we think about some, uh, I mean, increasing military expenditure of member country, I think there should be a kind of forum where we should discuss rule-based order. And then I think AOIP is a good place, a good kind of guideline to discuss rule-based order in this region. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I think, um... Okay, I think we are done with, let me check again um, if there are still any questions going on. Okay, I see uh, uh, Dr. Meli Caballero Antoni um, raising her hand. I'm not sure uh, I can give her the screen to speak. Uh, okay, uh, Meli, would you like to uh, ask your question online? Okay, um, if not, then, um, okay. If not, then I think um, we have gone through all uh, the questions that we have today. Uh, so thank you again. I would like to uh, post to Dr. Rizal Sukma for uh, giving the, the remarks um, today. Uh, and I think we, we uh, it's always interesting to be involved in a discussion about the ASEAN outlook on the Pacific because it's still uh, a very um, evolving um, document. Uh, a lot of discussions have been made. Um, a lot of positivism, uh, a lot of pessimism as well. So um, always uh, interesting to be involved on in the discussion about the uh, Mayo IP. Uh, and also thank you again uh, very much to Dr. Sundar Pal Singh and Dr. Yusuke Takagi for uh, giving your uh, comments and remarks and also for enriching the discussion today. Um, so uh, on behalf of uh, GRIPS, uh, RSIS and CSIS, I thank everyone uh, who joined us um, today in this discussion. And hopefully we can um, see each other again in the next uh, webinar uh, in this series. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, stay healthy. Uh, and good afternoon from, from Jakarta. Bye-bye.